this morning you said uh, as one of your priorities is the printed book has a glorious future. Uh, it seems to go counter with this just previous conversation that we will digitize, let us say, the work of the output of the 20th century and, and that assumes that the printed book might disappear, at least forms of the printed book, the monograph, let us say. So how do you bring those two together? Those two principles could be seen to be contradictory, but I'd have you bear in mind that one of our learnings of the last 20, 25 years since digital versions of particularly manuscripts and rare books have become available on the net is that consistently, wherever there's a project to digitize rare and unusual stuff, mm -hmm. one of the consequences is more people show up in person at the front door of the building to say, can I look at that for real? And they're looking at it for real uh, with a sharper, readier eye. They know what they're looking for, and they're ready to take advantage of it. Um, it's certainly the case that, you know, for example, all of the books that you can imagine buying in a bookstore today began as born digital. Um, they have been produced electronically on computer technology, and the fact of the printed book is an offshoot of that. I think we will see a change in the way the food chain is designed. Um, historically, that printed copy was at the top of the food chain. It was the only way in which this information could come out. I'm wondering which publisher soon will say, well, we don't produce the printed books any longer, but there's a way in which you can get one as a derivative object. Um, I'm following closely the development of print-on-demand technology. I'm surprised it hasn't come forward better than it has. I'm puzzled by that. I want to work on it because I think we will soon get to the point where the printed book, cheaply printed, serviceably printed, close to where you are, or virtually close to where you are, you know, in Amazon at this point doing same day delivery, so maybe Amazon will be the print on demand mm -hmm. technologist, uh, but will show up when I want it, when I need it, and I will even think about throwing it away afterwards. When I was young, this was absolute anathema. I can remember vividly at this moment, the day in 1970, when I took a copy of Dune Messiah in paperback, <laughs> deeply disappointed with it as a sequel to Dune, and took it down the hall and threw it down the trash chute and immediately felt like diving into the trash chute. Regret. I shouldn't have done that. Good heaven. <laughs> now I find, you know, they're a little more commodity. When I want to teach from a book now, I'm more likely to get a new paperback copy, mark it up for use in that semester, and if I don't teach that course again, it goes away, and maybe I have a better copy that's my reading, annotating, scholarly copy someplace, um, someplace else. Um, the printed book has a long and glorious future in front of it, especially if, I guess I would say, uh, we're good at what we do. And my point in talking about that was to say that I think we've come in libraries to a point where we need to be conscious and deliberate and intentional about which printed books we have in our library buildings, how they're presented there, who they're for, how we make sure that people use them. If we have a million and a half books in our main tower, as we do now at ASU, and not hardly anybody is going to look at them, those books are not as valuable as could be if you had 500,000 presented differently, selected differently, mm -hmm. um, sold differently to your, uh, to your student population. Uh, you need to think about the way in which you bring people to confront these things, not simply leave them with uh, call numbers on the spine mm -hmm. uh, for people to find if they know how to do that. We've got plenty of students now for whom that call number on the spine is not, as it was for our generation, a miracle of access, right, but right. a deep puzzle, what do I do with this? Well, we should be thinking about what we can do that's better than that. So how do you balance the competing needs for a, quote, core collection, and quote, a collection that serves the need of, of the people? Uh, we've had a number of scholars say, we, you must have this on the shelf. And your reason for needing the core collection on the shelf is what exactly? To represent the field. The to core works the in the field. Um, quite soon, if you read Against the Grain from Charleston, you'll see a column that I've written about my challenges finding uh, James Joyce's Ulysses mm -hmm. in print in the early 21st century. 
Uh, it's a lot harder than it used to be, but one of the steps in my quest was to go to the stacks of our own library and see what was, uh, see what was there. On the shelves, at the moment I went into the stacks, there were two checkoutable print copies of Ulysses. A bunch of others were checked out. Do those actually need to be on the shelves in the main building? Or could we be supplying those to whichever of our buildings? We have eight buildings to begin with. Could we be supplying them from our, librarians call it high density shelving facility? Yes. My president calls it your fulfillment center. <laughs> could we be supplying it from our fulfillment center mm -hmm. when it's so popular a title, when it's so well known, when it is core? Could we not instead begin thinking that the print collection in our buildings should begin to be a special collection, should begin to be different, should maybe rotate and turn over? Mm -hmm. um, should it be the place where the newest books are all shelved when they come in, including the ones in Croatian and, uh, and Hindi, uh, in order to display to students just what the range and possibilities are of what we have when they've got a pretty good idea that Homer and, and Joyce they're available around here somewhere, right. and they have a variety of techniques for getting their hands on them, including bootleg copies over the internet. Right. Uh, I'm not sure I'm ready to say that any book that's ready, that's readily available in bootleg copies uh, or uh, public domain copies on the internet doesn't need to be on our shelves, but I'm at least looking down the pathway in that direction to say, if something is really ubiquitously available, why am I spending the most valuable real estate I have on making a copy printed in 1956 that's getting a little tired mm -hmm. available? Mm -hmm. Not sure. For other library deans that are confronting the same issue, this, and they want to go ahead and just provide the books that people really want in, in the building, um, what are you guys doing at ASU as you plan to do this, how, what are you going to do with the, with the space that you get out of this? What are, what are the kind of priorities that you're looking at in terms of services and, and the things that a lot well, of can do with that space? Sure. We're planning a big renovation, and I'd say there are really three categories into which what we will have when the renovation is over will fall. Um, one, and I want this highlighted on the main floor as you come in the door, is exhibit and presentation and special collections space. Um, I think what differentiates us as libraries will increasingly be what we have that's used unique, and I want to present that and push it and sell it, uh, and I want to market it hard. Uh, second, we will have what we now, it's fashionable to call student success space, working space for our students. The value we provide in our building now to our students is a quiet, serious place to work as individuals, um, to engage in group study. I'm amazed that my generation, we were quite sure we were the smartest generation in the history of the human race, you remember that? <laughs> we, did, we weren't smart enough to invent group study. I walk around now and see students who've clearly made an appointment with each other in the evening yeah. for half a dozen of them to come to a particular place in the library and sit and work seriously for, for four hours. And I say, mm -hmm. yeah, we could have done that. Yeah. It's brilliant. Uh, we're also providing interactive classroom space um, on a scale that we've not done before. The other zone that we will have is what I'm calling the wizard zone. Uh, the space in which librarians, technologists, uh, data experts of various kinds will have centers for high-end research drawing upon uh, collections that broadly reach across the institution, uh, or broadly reach across the institution's mission, both as a place in which to do good and important work with technology that might be hard to come by otherwise, but also as a place in which to train students in the use of these technologies. We're about to post a position for a director of a geospatial research center, which is a very important thing for us to have. One of the reasons why that should be in the library, even though we have a school of geography on our campus, is because it's relevant to every discipline and every subject. Um, we expect some of the strongest demand for our geospatial center to come from the business schools, from people who are looking for tools and techniques to use and figuring out where to build the next Panera sandwich store. And we can help in that regard. Um, and we're also expecting it to come from the life sciences and sustainability people um, who are interested in the history and present nature of the planet and how to understand that. And by the way, they're going to have to stop off at our special collections because we have in the ASU library a large collection of aerial photographs of Arizona taken 50 years ago. 
and more. Uh, whatever your formal databases show about the history of land use and water use, aerial images can tell you stuff and help you focus your attention in ways you haven't done before. So the wizard zone will be the place where government documents and big data and geospatial and special collection stuff can come together and be used by high-end researchers and shown to and inculcated in the behavior of students, uh, of students as well. So you see, do you see this last being staffed by and people with joint appointments? Sure. A, a librarian with a joint appointment in, in geology, for instance, or geography uh, or political science, working primarily in this area to forge these partnerships. You'll do that, and I would expect to be a regular employer of postdocs. Yes. from various disciplines. Young people just finishing their degrees, okurah with the most important research technologies and the most important current work, and to be blunt about it, cheap to hire for a year or two uh, to come in and work with our folks, get some credential themselves, but at the same time help our mission. Um, and then when they're two years past their PhD and all those skills they had are obsolete, hire some other young men. Uh, I'm a little bit in jest when I say that, but there's always still advantage in being able to bring in uh, the freshest talent sure. at any given point.